Not Quite Cool is a podcast that contains spoilers, opinions, and general nonsense. Listener discretion is advised. Oh, the voice even sounds different now. That's crazy. Uh, so well, yeah, we were just talking about that. So good. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Start the show. Master right. ceremonies. Yep, let's do it. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Not Quite Cool. My name is Keith Brooks. I'm here, as always, with Chad Dowdy, who looks to be drinking eggnog. Is that what you're sipping on? No, you know, we don't usually record on Friday nights. This is a little Mexican mudslide. Oh, damn. Ooh, what's in that? What's in that? You know, a little Kahlua, you know, you know, just a little coffee liqueur coming at you. <laughs> oh, stuff. we're going to be a little loose this episode. That's great. I'm eating. Oh, a- I'm, I'm loosed up. I've, I've had my gummies. I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm eating an ice cream birthday cake, uh, so I'm going to get loose in my own personal way. And then here we're going to have with us, as always, uh, the lesion of the season. That's right, Mr. Robert Prago. How you doing, Rob? I just ate so much food. I'm taking my belt off because my pants are too tight. Gross. Uh, gross, uh, gross. The way he took that off was <laughs> disgusting. Absolutely. <laughs> Fucking Jeffrey like, Tubin over here. Trying now to- on the now on the main stage, Rob. Yeah. I don't know what it was. It was like <laughs> now I can't even weird. eat my ice cream cake, man. That's <laughs> terrible. It was like he's about to spank his child, but not quite. But I'm trying to be sexy about it. He's about to spank his child if he named his own ass his child and he just started <laughs> spanking it. This we just <laughs> went way grosser than I anticipated. Watch the ratings go through the roof. Ew. More views or listens. What are we? Yeah, you start the listening. podcast at the four minute mark. Which is, <laughs> the first 330 is like crash. It's just going to be a picture of a train wreck. Is it what's going to be on the YouTube channel? Um, but, uh, but speaking of podcast and not whatever Rob's talking about. <laughs> Uh, we got a lot of stuff to talk about here t- uh, this week, guys. Two things. Two we got things. a lot of movies that we've seen because it's been like two months. Uh, we're going to be ranking the MCU Disney Plus TV shows. We're going to be talking about our 31 for 31. And in addition to that, we have to mourn the loss of an icon of the geek world. Uh, but let's dive in first and foremost with the biggest movie out right now. Uh, and I can't think of three more qualified people to talk about the film. <laughs> Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. This is the 30th MCU film directed by Ryan Coogler, starring everybody that you loved from the original Black Panther film. In addition to that, we get Tanaka Huerta. Uh, we get Julia Louise dreyfus uh, We get um, Ironheart, our first introduction to that. Chad, what did you think about this second installment in the Black Panther franchise? So, you know, the opening scene... I have like tears are welling up in my face. And then when the Marvel logo pops up and it's just all Chadwick Boseman, like no sound, then they really started flowing the tears. It, I thought that they handled it, his real life death about as well as they possibly could with what they, with what they did. It wasn't like he died in battle. You know, one's trying to avenge him as far as that goes with a specific person. So I think it was well done with that aspect of it. That being said, all the other stuff, excellent too. Angela Bassett, bravo, bravo. Yeah. She was awesome yep. in this. I had, I've said before on the podcast that I'm, I'm a big fan of Namor in, in the comics. He's one of my favorite villains. And I, I think he was great in this. Uh, I yep. think it was very handled very well. I like the idea that they've changed his origin because it's less like Aquaman's and it's Marvel's own thing. And it even gives him more of the type of villain that you root for. And they, they did really well with that. Like the black Panther movies, Killmonger, you get where he's coming from. 100% you get where he's coming from. Namor, you get where he's coming from. And I think that is the well done aspect of the Black Panther series is the specifically the villains. They are exceptionally well done. Now, I do think that uh, when Sue Storm uh, arrives in the MCU, she's not going to be able to t- turn him down. Like, Mr. Fantastic Who? Forget about him. It, it's not going to work. He, he was awesome. Yeah. And then the uh, 
I love the, I, you know, in Black Panther, in the world, when they go into the astral plane or whatever it's called for them, you know, if T'Challa is dead, why wouldn't you see T'Challa? You know, storyline wise, they handle that perfectly with it being Killmonger. That's who it needed to be. And that I, I loved it. So a big thumbs up for this overall. We'll get into it more. But overall, Namor, excellent. Angela Bassett, excellent. You got a deep Black Panther. Excellent part two to me. Yeah. Now, Rob, what dumb shit do you have to say about this epically wonderful film? A dur da dur da dur and a dur. That's dur dur. Um, it was it was uh boy, it really was, you know, it, it was a very good movie. You, you know, it was you're right, it was so emotional at first. Chadwick Boseman was so private about his suffering and what he was going through that this almost seemed like the only funeral the world could cathartically grieve for him over. They, it's literally they had a funeral, not for, for T'Challa, for Chadwick Boseman. That's what was so, whoa. and it did, I, I, all by design. I mean, Ryan Coogler's just a phenomenal. He's one of the greats working today. It cast a pall over the whole thing as it should um, by design. And it was not maudlin, but just, it was, Again, the word depressing is wrong. It was melancholy. There was a melancholy the whole time. Um, it, it was a very, very good movie. Um, I, I enjoyed the hell out of it. It's in the top 10, I think, of Marvel movies for me, or, or right there. Um, but I, I think there's, this is going to sound ridiculous. There's something missing. And of course, of course there is. But what I mean by that is they didn't fill the gap. You really feel a hole in this story, you feel the way, even if they recast T'Challa, I still think you would feel an absolute gaping hole because uh, Chadwick Boseman was, I, I mean, not that nobody didn't realize what a force he was as an actor and how great he was at this role, but even if they did make the mistake of recasting this, I still think to be like, this is, there's something really wrong here. There's something missing. Um, I, I think they were smart not to, fill the suit till the end. Um, it was it was great. Angela Bassett should get it, from what I've seen so far this year, should get an Academy Award nomination yeah. for supporting actress. I, I just, every scene was just life or death. Don't fuck with me. I, I mean, it's you just, you literally, just the type of person you walk by, you, you're like, just don't even look at me. I, I just, you can't even deal with it. She was great. Great casting of, of Namor. Um, you know, again, I, I didn't read a lot of the Namor comics growing up, but because he's part of the MCU, he's part of or part of the Marvel comics. There's some ownership there as a fan, but the the change in the in the origin story didn't bother me at all. Matter of fact, I liked it even better because it did. I, I don't I don't want there to be two similarities with us in DC. Let them have their thing, and it didn't bother me in the least. It, it's the exact same thing, but now you get to spread it out a little bit into a. Uh, a, a to other ethnicities, ethnicities around the world. It's, it was great. I think it was handled perfectly. He's a great addition to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'm so fucking glad they didn't kill him like they tend to do with a lot of their with their villains. And like and like Chad was saying before, you know, uh, uh, what makes a, what makes a hero is an equally uh, you know force of a villain. And I think Michael Keaton did that well as Vulture because you understood where he was coming from. Immediately, you're like, he got, he got boned by Tony Stark immediately. Um, and let's not forget, Thanos was right. I mean, for the love. And, you know, that's yeah, so. um, it. Eight was billion great. right now. Eight billion on Earth. Just happened. It, it should be chopped down to four. Life is good. That's all I'm saying. I'm <laughs> fan. You heard it here right, right, second right, after Thanos. That's Rob right. Brody. Right right there. <laughs> Thanos is <laughs> brother. Um, you're not um, supposed to say that, Rob. That's right. Uh, Thanos is I'll beat brother. that out and people will have no idea, but they'll just know he's not supposed to say it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, we'll get back more. Keith, you jump in. Then we'll, 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 we'll get more detail. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that you guys are saying. I, I watched the movie one and a half times. Um, I, I had an incident the first time I tried to watch it. The buddy I was with watching the film had a panic attack during the movie. And so I had to go back and watch it a second time. Uh, without, you know, having any medical emergencies. And I kind of get why he had a panic attack because this is such a heavy, dark, 
different film than the first one. Like where I feel the first Black Panther was so vibrant and so colorful and these epic wide shots, this one was close. This one was claustrophobic. This one was about, let's get into the mindset of grief itself. You know what I mean? In a way that I thought was just cathartic, but also burdensome in the best of ways. I, I experienced emotions watching this. And Namor, I love, love, the little acrobatics they did to get his name to make sense in Spanish. Such a fucking great little move. Um, the culture that they developed for them. I love that. I think that's absolutely fantastic. And his, even though his story is drastically different than it is in the comics, it feels like he is the most accurate comic depiction we've ever had because his personality rang with all of the ego that Namor has in the comics. Like, and, and it was just fantastic to watch. And, you know, I don't agree with Letitia Wright as a person. Um, she holds a lot of views that I'm vehemently opposed to. Um, but she was remarkable in this movie. And the fact that the movie took us right at the beginning and threw us into the deep end, no pun intended, but then only to have that opening Marvel credit, like... Oh, it's silent? So Silent with just Chadwick Boseman. But it's not silent. That's the thing. It's not silent. There's a breeze underneath it. I'm always wrong. (laughs) No, but but you don't get that until the end when you see it the second time, right? Okay. When you see the memory that she has and the breeze is playing underneath it, then you realize, wait, there was a fucking breeze under the Marvel credits. Why is there a breeze? Because that's what Angela Bassett said. That's where she found him was in the breeze. And, like, that to come together as this beautiful homage and, like, yeah, I I wept like a baby. And then that post credit scene, oh, my God. Like, again, what a joyous way to keep that legacy alive without compromising with a recast or something like that. You know, I I just – I like this better than the first one. I I, I, – it misses the charisma of Chadwick Boseman, but it's just such a – moving study of grief that I fucking love it. I, it's also one of the only Marvel movies or superhero movies I can think of. We, by the time we get to the climactic battle, we don't want them to fight. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's hoping the fight stops, not hoping our hero wins, which is a cool, interesting place to be. Yeah. You like, did. You did not want them to fight at all on the, on the ship at the end. You're like, God, just this is, yeah, it was, I didn't want to see it. You know, we we just we can't wait for the final climactic battle. They were like, you know what? Let's just go. Let's just go get some pizza. Yeah. Let's just we, talk. We it almost out. wanted them to get together in that one scene yeah. in the cave. You know, you're like, oh yeah, th- these two kingdoms would get together, and then you know that they're gonna have to duke it out before it's over. But you, you know, you're talking about you know, the the thing on grief. Uh, Shuri, her journey in this movie was incredible. Like, yeah. There's no doubt from start to the very very end it it was incredible i didn't it was good enough to where i didn't know how the final battle would even play out yeah you know i be it was it was done that well that yeah you don't want namor to die obviously and in the back of your mind you're like they can't kill off namor he's he's a big time player in the mcu he can be a good guy bad guy he can do a lot of stuff yeah but still that battle was brutal between the two of them yeah so well done you know i dug it and you know like you were saying with the post credit scene i i didn't you know you can call me no i didn't see that coming me either i, I did all. not realize that she had a kid and i was watching with my wife and you know she doesn't usually call things but she was like i knew that she had a kid that's why she was not with them she was wow. away and all that she knew it was coming and i was like i must be dumb then because i did not see yeah. that coming it was it was shocking to me yeah. Not at all. Not at all. I like how it, 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 there were just little things that jumped out. Like, um, first of all, the movie was, this is going to sound weird. It was almost reflect, refreshingly serious and dour. Yeah. After the last, after the, after the, I'd say excessive silliness of the last couple, um, that this was just, wow. I mean, the, the, the pendulum swang, swang way um, to the other side. Um, I loved, because Namor has been around for 
I mean, 5,000 years? I mean, how, how long did they say he's been around? 500. I thought it was 5,000 years. They, was it only 500? Yeah. Um, the, his, his rules of war, his rules of engagement, where it was after that, he goes, grieve, bury your dead. We will do this again in a but week. Also, I, you're the queen now. Like, what a fucking statement. Like, yeah, yeah. It's wow. It was powerful, powerful, powerful. Um, uh, did, 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 uh, I do, and even though it was refreshingly down, there were still some fun moments. I, I love the fish out of water moments when Shuri and Denai Guerrera go to the school to meet up with Riri Williams, the whole, and those, those, those are fun. Those are nice. I think they were trying, they, they, it could have been a lot funnier. Some of the scenes away from uh, um, um, Wakanda, but I think they were afraid to make it too funny because generally speaking, um, generally speaking, Ross and uh, Valentina, her lines are much sharper, much crisper. Much, they bite harder. They're funnier. And the two of them, as great as they are as actors, they boy, those lines, I kept thinking, man, they really underwrote these things big time to not try to to not try to make it too funny. Because both those, Martin Freeman and her are just, I mean, I think legendary well, comic actors. I feel that it's more, I feel this is trying to be Captain America the Winter Soldier where it's setting, it's more akin, especially when we get to the Everett Ross and the Julia Louis-Dreyfus thing, it's setting political movements into action. Like, I see a lot of people online talking about how they don't like the inclusion of Riri Williams or they don't like the inclusion of uh, the Countess. And, like, to me, those are crucial things because, A, with Riri, she is what Namor and Shuri are fighting over. Like, how do we react to the outside world? That's the driving force of the actual plot line. You know what I mean? And more as a reflection of if T'Challa had stayed the way his father wanted him to go, you know, and, and Shuri is the outreach. So to me, Riri is our briefcase from Pulp Fiction. But I feel that Everett Ross and uh, Fontaine represent, like, the repercussions because by the end of this movie, Wakanda has no allies and that's huge going forward. We now have established everything they were afraid of. What happens when the rest of the world gets vibranium? We're about to find out because the United States are coming after it, you know, and that sort of sets us up for what I think is going to be America going to war with Wakanda. Um, and, and so to me that like that all plays, there's that, tongue-in-cheek aspect of them being exes but it plays more like a political chess game you know what i mean that's going to create some really nice tensions with bucky and that what, what's that group called again the, the movie the thunderbolts. Uh, thunderbolts. thunderbolts when they when they're when they're tasked by valentina and ross to go in there mm-hmm. that's going to be fucking great well Man. not by oh by thunderbolt ross yeah um well yeah it's true thunderbolt or not not what's his name not yeah not everett but mm-hmm. Valentina may have control over that too. I, it's it's a, but yeah, you got to think it's gonna be it's gotta be Harrison Ford. They're not paying him all that money. He's gonna be in control. Absolutely. And he will go and he will go Red Hulk, I, I would imagine. Yeah, I think they've said that yeah, it yeah. might be a rumor that he's going Red Hulk. Yeah, yeah. the rumor is so. he's the president. And but at the same time, like Everett Ross is now a fugitive, awesome. you know. And so it's interesting to see how does that play into secret invasion. Yeah, he has no power to help Wakanda, all that stuff. Yeah, it was, it was really good. You know, and for the people, and again, I've heard a lot of people bitch and moan about the inclusion of Riri Williams. These people who bitch and moan about that, have they not been watching the Marvel Cinematic Universe since the get-go where they, they use movies to introduce other characters so they can move forward? This is, this is not a, rev- it's like, oh, my, this is not a revelatory thing. That's how T'Challa was introduced in Civil War for his own. I mean, it's, she was so, that actress was great. I've never, I'm not familiar yeah, with the work. I, uh, to the point where I'm like, and again, she was so different personality-wise than everybody else. I can't wait for her series. I'm like, she was Absolutely. fucking great. Cannot wait. Now, you were talking about um, um, uh, Letitia Wright, who was excellent and really, you know, carried the mother load of this movie. That being said, this is how good everybody else, this is how good the casting is. Lupita, uh, Lupita Nyong'o and Denai Guerrera have infinitely more gravitas and weight and I take those two actresses more seriously in their character than I took Letitia Wright. And Letitia Wright was awesome. L- L- Lupita Nyong'o could just look at you and I'm like, I give. 
Yeah. You know, Denai Guerrera is I give where Letitia Wright is okay. She's she's fun. It's refreshing, and maybe that stuff she can do. It's just it's. But those, the other two of those, fuck man, they, they are they are badasses, and the 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 future of Denai Guerrera is limitless. She should have her own series. I love the fact that she got that she got canned from her job just to see what she how she was under those circumstances. Um, it, it was absolutely great. And um, the movie needed more. Um, uh, I just forgot his name. Uh, Winston uh, Duke. Winston Duke. Oh, yeah. That Bucket. dude is he is so good. I mean, just he's always got a. There's always just a little bit of a devilish smile on his face when he shows up and then he goes, I've come to compete for the top. Well, <laughs> yeah. knowing full well that he is. He's sure he's mentor who he will be there. He'll take care of it. But that being said, now you realize in the next movie, there's got to be, they're going to have to butt heads over what's best for Wakanda. And if he's ruling, you know, I think he's going to butt heads with the uh, Black Panther a little bit. That's awesome. Uh, just having, having Namor, I think what's going to be fun is having everybody mispronounce his name in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And yeah. Yeah. And um, he, he's really, he is, a, he's going to be a great, weapon for this universe to use i'm playing playing both sides of the coin absolutely doing strictly what's best for his i mean when his when uh i can't remember, I can't remember was that his wife or his cousin cousin who, when his cousin was berating him at the end for being weak he's like you don't know what I'm, you have no idea we're the only people they can trust now we're their allies they come to us we have totally control over this and it's just oh he just just played yeah he's playing four-dimensional chess it was beautiful he just i mean he took an ass kick and don't get me wrong yeah, uh, yeah, he got his ass kicked, uh, you know, six ways from Sunday. But I cannot wait to see him dealing with everybody else. That's going to be very nice. Well, you know, on to that. I thought I saw this or heard it. They were talking about it. I thought it leaked. And then I just thought maybe I'm a crazy person. I thought at one point it leaked that there was a stinger with Dr. Doom. Did you hear about this, Keith? Mm-hmm. That was always the rumor, but I never heard it confirmed or anything. Oh, okay. Because that's what I was thinking that, like, the post, the end credit sequence would be. Yeah. Would be, you know, Namor Way and Doom showing up. Yeah. Because, you know, that's kind of like one of the earliest supervillain team ups in the Marvel Universe was yeah. Doom and Namor. So that's what I thought it was going to be. Uh, but, but of course, you know, it didn't happen. But when you're talking about how badass they were, it was an awesome shot kind of at the beginning of the film when Angela Bassett's talking to the UN, but it's, you know, juxtaposed by these mercenaries or whatever, breaking in, trying to steal the vibranium. They get into the thing. When they open that door, the oh. music and the door oh. melange, <laughs> walking forward, I'm like, these dudes are about to get their ass kicked. It was awesome. What a great moment. Just one of my favorite awesome moments of the movie. It's just like, oh, and so music- good. The music throughout this film, I think, is just the scoring. I, I, I don't necessarily care as much for the needle drops, but the, the scoring, yeah. I absolutely love. The little siren song that the uh, Tlalo Khan sing is absolutely awesome. Oh, the, yeah. the, the, that high pitch whoop, noise that happens when the Dora Milaje come out, that's fantastic. And I love that like some elements of this, it felt like Kugler was shooting a scary movie, like a horror film. You know what I mean? Like when we first see Namor, we don't see him full light. We see him in the dark, having thrown a helicopter out of the fucking sky. Like it's just badass. It's just incredible. And even something as ridiculous as the wings, that scene where he's going through Wakanda and just wrecking house and the close up as his feet stop right in front of camera and he switches directions. That was incredible. That was incredible to watch. And you mix that with all of these amazing performances like Lupita Nyong'o, like Denise, they, they, you know, they, they even have back to that element again of like that espionage sort of feel where, where you know, Lupita speaking six different languages in the movie, you know what I mean? And we're bouncing back and forth from continents. It feels like a cooler version of James Bond. And I, I fucking loved it. It was awesome. Who is the who is the character? Who is the badass? Uh, um, um, Namor's he was like the enforcer who was always Atuma. With Atuma. that fucking guy. Wow, he, he's traditionally all- straight up bad guy. He's not but, usually, you know. I mean, I know he's a bad guy in this, but you know, where Namor can be good. Or yeah. Atuma is most of the time a bad guy. He well, might have been the biggest badass in the fucking movie. He was yeah. just so just he, unstoppable. I, 
I think I hope they build that up because he he will eventually turn on Namor and like try to seize the throne from him in the comics and stuff like that. But our buddy Chris Burns was in charge of his costume on set. Uh, oh, that's awesome! So that's great. great. That's really cool. Yeah. And that guy was great. And it just you talk about an actor who just just walked as if he had no fear. And it was just supreme confidence and never lost a fight. And to see that juxtaposed against Denai Guerrero who we've seen just, like you said, lay waste to people. And you see her get her ass kicked. It's like, yeah. damn, that's that's impressive. That was Absolutely. impressive. Absolutely. Well, speaking of impressive things, uh, Black Panther wasn't the only film to change the hierarchy of superhero films. Uh, another film came out recently, um, Black Adam, starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Pierce Brosnan. Uh, Chad and I saw this. I don't think Rob did. Um, so, Chad, I did not see that. No, I did not see that. I'll be right back. Chad, what did you think about Black Adam? I like how Rob said, I'll be right back. Like, we need to know that. Yeah, exactly. We, we can see him getting up. He's not going to talk about Black Adam. It's it's fine. Or any we of the it. next 19 films we saw. <laughs> exactly. This, this is a funny thing. You know, a little peek behind the curtain with the, the listeners. We texted. I texted all the stuff I saw. It was maybe like 10 things. Keith texted like 10 things. And Rob's reply was, I've heard of three of those things. Yeah, exactly. That was his reply. Not that I haven't seen any. He's like, I've maybe heard of three of those things. And so, then he, he told me, let's just talk about Black Panther in our rankings. And I'm like, no, fuck you. This is on principle <laughs> alone. We're going through all of this. So Black Adam came out. That's a major. It's a major film. Yes. For our genre. Yeah. The Rock in the DCEU movie. Yeah. Plus, Warner Brothers released two movies the latter half of the year, yeah, exactly. and this is one of them that's exactly. not doing so great. But go ahead. No. And and to that point, it was fine. It, you know, to me, there were some good moments. That the Rock is hard not to like. So I, I love The Rock. I'm a big fan of The Rock. You know, the movie had some T2 vibes as far as the kid trying to teach The Rock about stuff, you know, a good little call. bit like that. Um, but Really, at times, it reminded me of a CW show. Yeah. Not, not in a good way. Yeah. Because I like the CW shows. Arrow, I love Arrow. Flash, I like all that. But not for this, you know. So it reminded me of that. And, you know, <clears throat> this, this is my disappointment with the movie. All encompassed in one shot. Finally, at the end of the film, when he takes the throne, I literally was like, yes that's the shot i love it and then he just you know flies up and breaks it and he's like he this says doesn't feel, feel right, right. with well, that's the first <laughs> thing you've done that is teth adam like yes exactly uh, i was like that's the shot thank you he looks awesome right there in that moment and then it doesn't feel right i'm like yeah this that's kind of what the movie is to me it doesn't quite feel right absolutely you know, i yeah you know, you go ahead, like JSA's in it, you know, that's, it could have been a JSA movie, you know, as far as yeah. that goes, but, you know, you go ahead. I think there's some good components to it. I think Pierce Brosnan's Dr. Fate is, it's fantastic. I thought he was great. Uh, I didn't really get enough of Adam Smasher or Cyclone. Um, Hawkman, you had an amazing, because Hawkman is such an interesting character and they just ignore everything that makes him interesting in this film. There's a moment where Pierce Brosnan says something about you may die. And Hawkman replies, I'm not afraid of death. Okay. Cheesy, dumb action line with one, one rewrite just to say it wouldn't be the first time. Oh yeah. Perfect. You change it. You give us an insight into who his character is all of that. You have a more interesting, compelling person to play with now. You know what I mean? Um, and I feel the whole movie is that I feel the whole movie is trying is doing the opposite of what Namor is doing in Black Panther where N Namor like got it he got how to be the anti-hero he got how to be villainous this is just trying to make Black Adam a hero without letting him have any of the darkness that he's supposed to carry with him you know what I mean and and even the stinger with Superman I didn't feel it was written like stupid like superman i felt it was stupid like um i mean yeah it's great to see him back but the whole thing felt like it was a movie i could have seen in the late 90s like it was a throwback to a different era you know what i mean it definitely felt that way too you're right but, 
But speaking of throwback movies from a different era, let's talk about another anthology film that we saw, VHS 99. Uh, this is the 945th installment of the series. Uh, the 99th. Released, yeah. <laughs> released on Shudder. <laughs> Chad, what did you think about VHS 99? As far as the VHS, this is one of the weaker entries to me. Uh, you know, we talk about it, anthologies, there's positives, negatives to some of them. This this was one of the weaker VHS, you know, for one, there's no wraparound. I kind of like the wraparound in, in VHS, uh, but there's not one in this. So that was kind of well, disappointing. There, there arguably is one. It just wraps around at weird points. You know what I mean? Like the little, the, the stop motion thing they're yes. making, but whatever. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's five there's five shorts or whatever. The, um, the punk rock one didn't enjoy. No, oh, I nothing like that about one. nothing. I didn't, I didn't enjoy that one. The sorority one was, I like the idea yeah. better than what happened. I thought it was a cool idea. Uh, it, to me, it didn't really succeed. <laughs> the Aussie's arcade or Aussie's dungeon or whatever it was, I love the first part when it was the Double Dare show and people, kids were getting hurt. I was very intrigued. I was digging that so much. And then it just became like a snuff film. Like, yeah. you know, after that, what, whatever. I did like the Medusa one. Uh, it was a nice twist. Um, and then the last one was the best one. But Absolutely, yeah. It was, it was by the same team I talked about last week, uh, last podcast, uh, that did Deadstream. Same exact okay, awesome. directors. Um, lead actor was the same. The, the female actor is also the same in Deadstream. But that one, even though it was good, it, did, it felt the least like VHS to me. Yeah. It, because of where they went and what they did. It didn't feel like it should be part of the VHS anthology to me. Although I liked it on its own, I didn't like it as a whole with everything else. To me, that one was so creative that it stood out and made the others seem less creative because of how like new it was. And and I agree completely. That was my favorite one was that last one. Um, but yeah, like I, I think the VHS movies, anytime you have an anthology, you're going to have hits and misses. And you really, it's hard to tell. You have to cross that bridge when you come to it. Speaking of which, uh, Chad watched another scary movie uh, on Netflix starring Marlon Wayans, I believe, called Curse of Bridge Hollow. Is that right? Uh, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about Curse of Bridge Hollow? Well, you said scary. And it's more, you know, kitty scary. Okay. It's kind of like Netflix. This is on Netflix. And it's kind of like this year's Hoobie Halloween. Gotcha. Adam Sandler awesome. Halloween movie from last year. You know, it's it's comedy. The the terror isn't real terror. The gist of it is, is Marlon Wayans moves uh, to the new town, uh, you know, Bridge Hollow with his wife and daughter. The daughter is um, uh, Pariah Ferguson, I believe that's her name. She's Erica in Stranger Things. Oh, awesome. So, so and basically through a curse or something like that, the Halloween decorations come to life. So they have to, you know, stop the curse. So it's it's fun. You know, it, it's gateway horror for kids. It's something that, you know, that like an eight-year-old would love. It, I mean, I liked it too, don't get me wrong. But it's definitely, you know, kitty horror. Uh, but I, I wouldn't mind if Netflix every year just have like a kitty Halloween-centric movie every year. I'm for it, for sure. Absolutely. I think Netflix has some great um, content, especially I feel they do really well at that kid a teenage uh, genre that they're aiming for. It's a mystery how they do it, but one of the ways they solve that mystery is the next film that I saw, also on Netflix, starring Millie Bobby Brown and Henry Cavill. That's right, Superman himself getting rid of the cape, putting on a, a deer stalker hat. Is that what it's called? He doesn't really wear it, so fuck it. Enola Holmes 2 on Netflix. Uh, I just watched that, and it's absolutely fantastic. I love the first one. The second one, I think, goes above and beyond, and it adds to the Sherlock Holmes mythos in some really creative ways. Um, it's You get pretty early on that they're doing Moriarty, but who Moriarty turns out to be is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and Millie Bobby Brown is just great in this character. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't think she's done a lot of other characters. I can't think of any. Um, I'm sure there's some stranger stuff that she's done, but... Uh, but yeah, she's phenomenal in this one. And uh, so if you're... So I love the first right one. There. I love the first one. I mean, I love yeah. the first one. I just haven't cut, cut the second one yet. Yeah, the I second the first one, is, one too. Yeah, I dug it. 
Yeah, I, I love the second one. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. And Cavill's great in it. He gets to play drunk in a scene, and that's fun to watch. So, uh, yeah, check out um, that Enola Holmes 2 on Netflix. Now, let's talk. Have there been, have there, real quick, have there been any store, uh, rumors of him doing a Sherlock Holmes spinoff at all? I mean, they're going to, I mean, it, make, it almost makes sense to him to do a, yeah, a Downey's they, been, it's been a while for Downey, but they, Netflix should do a, I don't know what his relationship with Netflix is, though. Like he just blew off The Witcher. Um, yeah, so rumor about that is like, that it was the, he had issues with the writers. But it sort of sets up for a Sherlock Holmes spinoff at the end of this one. So, gotcha. uh, No well, Sam Claffin in this, though? No, no. Um, but yeah, but very enjoyable film. Now, let's talk about something on Disney+. Plus. Finally, we got... A, um, what I think we all can agree is an amazing Star Wars television series, and that is Tales of the Jedi. Uh, Chad and I both watched this entire series. Chad, what did you think about Tales of the Jedi? This was excellent. I mean, yeah. it was excellent. The only thing that I wanted, and there could be more of this, that I want more. It's called Tales of the Jedi, and I would like to see Tales of the Jedi. Get something in the you know old republic like high republic era, all the way Ray or Finn right now. They don't have to be stories that makes a lot of canonical canonical sense. You know, just you know whatever. Just they're doing a run or something. Anything, you know, give me a lot bigger time frame than what we got. Let's see Luke in between. You know, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi doing something. Yeah, or after Return of the Jedi. You know, just yeah, that would be cool. Have him teaching the younglings Luke you know give me some tales of the Jedi because I felt like what this was is just the Clone Wars extension of the yeah. Clone Wars it's you know, so good fine Dooku. I love the Clone Wars yeah. Yeah. yeah and it was cool seeing young Dooku you know as far as that goes um the Sith Lord episode was my favorite the one where um Yaddy or Yaddle I can't remember her name yeah, was no. fighting Dooku. Dooku that was excellent Dude. but the final episode with Ahsoka that Inquisitor looked awesome. Yeah. That was the like, best looking Inquisitor. It looked kind of like Darth Revan. Yeah, that's exactly bit. what I was going to say. And that's my my singular complaint as well, is I would like to see some Jedi that we haven't seen in films. Give me something random. But Yaddle, oh my God. So a lot of revelations. One, it's crazy to realize that Yoda <laughs> just has mental problems. With, the rest of his species doesn't talk like that. You yeah, know what I you mean? you know that, Rob? I did not know this. So he's the only one who talks like that. He's the yes. only one. Yeah. Do they do they she's comment like, on it? Do they comment like, "What the fuck is wrong with that guy"? No, she's just like, "Hey guys, you probably uh, shouldn't go to the dark side." You know, like, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what. So it's Bryce Dallas Howard doing this old lady voice, but her syntax is totally fine. So I think Yoda got hit in the head at some point or something. Something's fucked up with Yoda, or Yoda's just an alcoholic. Um, but there's a scene where that's Dooku awesome. and Palpatine are killing her. And they drop this big metal hanger door on her and crush her. And then she picks it back up and like falls out to go fight them. And then they, they behead her. And it's like, it's so intense. And, and it's awesome. So she many says. episodes just give you these weird insights into we've never seen Ahsoka Tano's culture before, but the very first episode we learned about it's a matriarchal society, all this stuff. We see young Qui-Gon Jinn voiced by Liam Neeson. We see the funeral of Qui-Gon Jinn, uh, which I've never seen a Jedi funeral before. And so, like, all of that, it was just, at least never with, like, the lights going up in the yeah, sky. So that's about to say. You're acting like Rob or something. Well, was know, it, a, was like, it better than a Ravager? Jedi have died. Was it better than a Ravager funeral? Or what's better? Yeah, because a Ravager funeral is just, like, fireworks in a white neighborhood. This was, like, <laughs> beautiful. Like, it's technology i don't understand ravage is just a redneck funeral yeah and, okay yeah plus there's right. like no sound in space so you can't even hear the firework yeah it's just which is good for dogs i guess but i don't know um that you guys just, got real serious on me you guys gonna say you guys got real serious on me there with the beheading i was gonna i was gonna try to make a joke about you know i don't think star wars is really taking it far enough i really think they should really lean into maybe something triple x like tattletales of the jedi and, and have strippers and <sighs> i was gonna say that but then you were like they beheaded her, and I was like, "Why?" Well, you know, kind of, kind of put a put a, a pall over the whole thing. Here. Rob, real so, quick, do you want to go over your complicated relationship with Star Wars again? Because I feel like we touched on that every episode. You know, every week, Chad, it gets more and more complicated. I think I love it, I hate it. It's we're together, then we're then we're not talking, and yeah. it's just 
It's awful, man. It's about to get complicated on. with me once we get to the Andor section of the show. I'm going to tell you that much. Yeah. Well, we're going to put that. <laughs> we're going to put that off for a little bit longer, just so that we uh, keep Rob here Rob for has a while. To stay. Yep. Uh, the Hatfields but, and McCoys when it comes to Andor. God which, yeah, that's true. It's a very devilish relationship. But talking about devilish relationship and what possesses us to talk about films, Chad watched My Best Friend's Exorcism, which I believe is on Amazon. Um, Chad, what did you think about My Best Friend's Exorcism? Yeah, this was on Amazon Prime. Uh, this was a fun one as a part of my Halloween watch. Um, you know, it's typical where a girl gets possessed by a demon. But what I liked about this is, unlike, you know, The Exorcist where she's like, you know, rah, rah, talking like a demon or whatever, she just starts fucking with her friends. So she's like stealing her friend's boyfriend. She's putting like peanuts in this girl's sandwich that has a peanut allergy. Like that is, it's like a, almost a mischief demon. Not even That's like- awesome a hardcore demon. So it was like fun in that regard. And the ex, the priest exorcist in this one is one of the guys that comes to the school that might've happened in your school or whatever, where they're these bodybuilders and they're like, we're going to lift you up to Jesus. Yeah. And it's like, that's going to help us lift this 500 pound dumbbell. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> like that, that's the exorcist. And then when like shit gets real, when he starts doing it, he's like, i'm out of here you're on your own you know so it's just it was just like a fun you know fun exorcist movie which i wasn't expecting that because you know a lot of exorcist movies they they can get dark they can be scary jump scares it, it was just fun i mean i don't know what else to say a fun demon possession movie that's awesome i i watched a demon possession film uh, i watched pray for the devil uh which is a new exorcist exorcism film about a female exorcist and uh, it's pretty good. I mean, I like Catholic horror. That's my favorite genre of horror to begin with. So this obviously plays into all of those things. It plays into all of those tropes. A, a little bit of it seems sort of self-serving, but it is a good, fun watch about demons. So if you want a nice spooky movie, that's a great one. I also watched another film about demons. Uh, this one is stop motion, though, um, directed by Henry, Harry Salick or whatever his name is. The guy who did Nightmare Before Christmas and written and produced by Jordan Peele. Um, and it's called Wendell and Wild. Um, and it's about a girl who is called the Hell Maiden because she can trans uh, fix herself through our world and the demon world. She has a connection to that. And she summons two demons to bring back her dead parents. But it's all stop motion. It's got some musical numbers in it. It's got a great cast. Angela Bassett's in it as well. Uh, Key and Peel play the two demons. Um, and it's super fun. Nice little uh, stop motion animation film that you should check out on Netflix. Um, then I saw... I'm sorry. We're going to do like three that I saw. Uh, oh. I saw another scary movie on Netflix called Mandrake. And this is an Irish horror film about the legend of the mandrake, which is a um, a plant that can birth humans or the blood of it can cure illnesses. And so the story is about a Irish parole officer who her new client is a woman that everybody in town thinks is a witch. Is she really or is she not? And sort of this dark, Irish, Irish fucking movie. Like, to the extent that they're speaking English the entire times, but sometimes the subtitles would just have a question mark because uh, they didn't know what they were saying. <laughs> so, but a very, very good film. Like, I, I highly recommend this if you like movies that deal with the occult and have that dirty, earthy feel. This was a great watch. Um, I also watched the new Sam Rockwell film, See How They Run. Uh, that also has Adrian Brody in it and uh, Cersei Ronan. Um, and it's it's super fun. It's on HBO Max. It's a whodunit set around an Agatha Christie play. And we see a cameo from uh, Moaning Myrtle from Harry Potter plays Agatha Christie in it. So um, it's a fun little delightful, lighthearted romp. Um, I also watched the eight episode series Cabinet of Curiosities uh, by Guillermo del Toro. Um, so eight different episodes, all with different directors, most of them dealing with Lovecraftian horror. I think, again, like any <laughs> anthology, any anthology, it's like hit or miss. Um, 
there was one episode I really hated, but there were like six I really loved. And it's got some great cast members. Crispin Glover is in an episode, and it's phenomenal. It's my favorite Crispin Glover performance. Um, Andrew Lincoln's in an episode. Uh, Tim Blake Nelson. Like, the cast are just phenomenal. So if you like that spooky Lovecraftian thing, this is Guillermo getting to do all of that. Uh, we have giant right, rats, squid monsters, all sorts of crazy shit. You and, liked his performance, Chris McGovern's performance better in that than his dance in Friday the 13th. Which four. is an amazing dance, but he's in Pickman's Model, which is about an art student who summons demons to paint them, right? In the, in like, in Boston in like 1906 or something like that. And the Bostonian accent that Crispin Glover chooses to do is so fucking ridiculous. I can't stop just watching him because it's, and it's him versus Ben Barnes, who's an incredible actor in his own right. So to see those go toe to toe, oh my God, it's so much fun. Uh, so yeah, I highly recommend that again on Netflix. Uh, but now let's talk about an amazing Another piece of Star Wars material available on Disney Plus, and that is Zen, oh, the Grogu short, uh, done Fuck by you. the studio <laughs> Ghibli. Chad, what did you think about uh, Zen? This was worthless, it was a waste <laughs> of time, and it was three minutes long. I'd like to have those three minutes back, please. It was ridiculous, it looked like a freaking computer screensaver. That's all it was, yeah. It, there was this was nothing uh this is this adds to my complicated relationship with star wars rob I, that's how chad sold it to me they told me to go watch it i was like no i you literally said that's how he pitched it to me i was like no no not a chance in hell am i gonna go waste three minutes on that and i did not yeah but i did say keith keith is going to talk about how the, the studio is doing amazing things and how awesome it is and how revolutionary this short was so go ahead yeah, I will say it's revolutionary in the sense that it is a crossover. It, it is the first time, like, Studio Ghibli's bringing characters that are very beloved of theirs in the Dust Mites to meet Grogu. That's cool. The story, it, and There's no story to this. It is a screensaver. Absolutely. I'm surprised they didn't ride pipes that were being built in the background. But uh, it was cute but it was nothing. It's just three minutes. So I was a little high when I watched it. So fine. It was fine. Um, but yeah, it's nothing to write home about. I don't think <laughs> it's worthless. Yeah. It's the I, single most worthless thing that we have watched and covered on this show. That's not true. Let's get to our next show. Uh, <laughs> oh, you are Frank. <laughs> uh, and that is Andor uh, on Disney plus. Um, so 11 episodes have been released. I've watched all 11. I think Rob has watched all 11 and touched himself to those. Chad, you've watched how many? Nine? Nine. So I haven't seen the last two. Okay, awesome. Uh, Chad, what are your impressions so far about the first nine that you've seen? Well, you know, last time Rob said, oh, it's going to be awesome. You know, the heist, to get to the heist or whatever. The heist was fine. It was good. I, I enjoyed the heist. Fine. The, it was the problem, fine. The problem was after the heist, <laughs> we were back to slowness again i'm like come on then you know so i'm at the point where he's been arrested he's in prison i really am enjoying the prison stuff i i am enjoying that immensely i think it's a very clever prison i like the setup of the prison i like all that i don't like every time that we cut to something else i don't care about his girlfriend i don't care about his mom i don't care about mon mothra i don't care about scars guard it's all great i don't care about the investigation I don't care about anything else that's going on. The prison stuff is cool. But even the way he got put in prison, to me, is kind of dumb. Yep. In the sense it's like super convenient. Yeah. I know you're saying, like, we're just random people. Yeah, I grabbed him. Like, that's the random. I don't like that, how he got into prison. So um, this show is fine. I feel like if this show was not a part of Star Wars, I probably would not be watching it. I can't, Damn. Even, I can't i can't even it, it, it's just you can't even describe how much you dislike the show is that what you're trying to say rob <laughs> it's, just, it's almost as like unless you guys are watching a couple of shitty cosplayers dress up with 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 lighting swords uh they, you know it's just not canon it's just not it's not it's not the real star it's, 
God. It's the best. Re- the, the, you have no leg to stand on when you preach how great possibly the worst directed written show in the history of fucking streaming. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Which which was akin to a bad Saturday morning Sid and Marty Croft show. I feel unbelievable. I feel your reviews <laughs> of Andor are oh. all what about ism. You know what I mean? It's like oh. it's like you're like, but her emails, her emails, folks, bad emails. Does he know what I did? Like, so what do you uh. think about Andor? Oh my God. Um Stellan Scars Sparred. Stellan Scars Bard. Stellan, <laughs> the back. I got to stop drinking during these things. Stellan Skarsgård is my favorite character in Star Wars history. Oh my gosh. He is the linchpin to everything that begins in A New Hope. He is, he is the first actor who seems to be impervious to the curse of making good actors look like shit in Star Wars. He is phenomenal. He should get nominated for best actor in a drama in a limited series, or I don't know if it's gonna be limited or not. Um, phenomenal. His monologue in episode 10 might be oh, I can't next, wait. next to Jeff Daniels monologue in news, uh, uh, not news, newsroom, newsroom. Dumb and Dumber. Newsroom, yes. When he was on the toilet. <laughs> Might be one of my it's favorite like... monologues. <laughs> and just the way he was lifting himself off. I mean, you know how hard yeah. that is to do? It's kind of, yeah. Uh, um, so incredible. It's uh, possibly Andy Serkis, who, Andy Serkis is a very good actor. And I will say this, where his part goes, Chad, I, I guess you've, you've already gotten through the, the jail stuff. You, you passed it. I'm not done with the jail stuff. Uh Gotcha. They just figured out that, like, I think you can't really get out of there. People come back or something like that. Gotcha. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to this being the Snoke origin story. And then maybe I might. <laughs> Good one, Chad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I heard people say that because you could hear it in his voice. Yeah, I guess it's uh... anyway. His arc through the next episode is such a phenomenal arc. It's my favorite non CG live action Andy Circus part. Don't even bring up the Batman. He was terrible at Batman. What terrible. It was poorly written. His Alfred was awful. Shut up, Keith. That's what I'm saying. By the way, Keith almost threw up during the last review he was talking about. I didn't want to bring that up, but now I have to because he's ragging me. Literally stopped four times to almost projectile vomit, which would have been really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And that would have been better than Obi-Wan Kenobi, by the way. Um, The the, the tension, the, the fact that this show is shot on location, it looks real, it's visceral, it's practical, it's not in the volume. It's a big fun of the volume. Fucking volume. I'm, Do you not like the volume at all? The way you know, I, I, the volume's all right. You know, I think yeah, I think it's I, fine. Okay. It was great the first season of a of a Mandalorian. It looked like shit in Thor Love and Thunder. It looked like shit in Thor Love and Thunder. Um, by the way, folks, Andor is one of the best Star Wars products ever. I don't know if anybody at home knows this, but I've got a complicated relationship <laughs> with Star Wars. There have been like 17 projects and I've like five of them. And this thing, this might be my, this might be better than a new hope. This might be wow. better than return of the Jedi. This might be better than uh, Keith's uh, Deadpool typical Tuesday. It might be. It is. It's it is possible. Yeah. It's possible. And or it's better than your, no, typical Tuesday. It's a close. It's close. It's, <laughs> no, I think it's uh, much better. <laughs> you know, had Keith actually directed Deadpool a typical Tuesday. <laughs> Stay. I mean, that would have been great. So I get to inside baseball. I feel like the acting is much better in Andor for sure. But, oh, yeah, definitely. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just saying this. I don't know what drugs seeped into these, my two co hosts here, but if anybody at home is listening to this, watch Andor. It, you don't even have to be a Star Wars fan. You just have to be a, a fan and a, a person who appreciates excellent writing, excellent storytelling, casting drama tension or or you can go get some milk and cookies and watch obi-wan can go kenobi and which is working it'll put you to sleep you don't have to be tired that's that's perfect 
It just zonk you out. It's his new elementary. I it's think like indoor slash melatonin. Perfect. <laughs> you have no right to fucking go after elementary when you're watching Murder She Wrote like it's like it's oxygen. Like it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> also, I feel that every time every time he says Obi Wan. <laughs> I'm just going to get a little sample of like, hello there. Like that's just all the show is going to be. Um, I look, I, I think, I think Andor it's fine. It's all right. No, I'm kidding. It's, it's good. It's good. But I, I have the same complicated dilemma with it that Chad does where some episodes just feel slow, man. Some episodes feel like we're going backwards and then they pay off. But ultimately I can't help but feel like the moment he goes back into jail, I'm not, no, not my poor favorite character. I'm like, oh, fuck, we're doing this now? Like, it felt like the inertia was taken out of it. Um, I love where it goes with that storyline, but it is this, like, push and pull. But I also I recognize I'm 37 years old. I'm not 56 or something like God, that. God, you right? are so fucking old. Yeah, just, I, I'm eating my birthday cake Jesus. right now. But I think, like, maybe... Maybe if I was closer to Rob's age, then I would enjoy. Then you would have perspective and, over yeah. the grounded depth and reality of and of the Star Wars movie. Yeah. Yes. Pe- <laughs> people that lived through World War II really are digging this. Is that what we're, that what we're like, on? That's what Rob's at the court. He's like, yes, this reminds me of the regiment back then. <laughs> Except hey, I lived through the, the I lived through the '60s, man, and I and I know I was I saw the hippies. You know, the tree hoggers. I know I can he deal with that, these like, Andorians. They're horrible people. Oh, he also the, says it like he wasn't hippies. four. <laughs> like he was the hippies. Um, but yeah, but I, I like it. Look, I, I think there's a lot of amazing moments. I think Stellan Skarsgård is phenomenal in it. I think the casting is perfect all the way across the board. I just sometimes find it a little lagging for me. Um, but- it's no Grogu. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's no uh, Grogu's fucking awesome. You gonna shit on Grogu? Well, the three minute thing you just talked about, but that's not you shit on Grogu as a character, not the well, I shit on thing. Grogu's three minutes short. No, he started shitting on Grogu the minute Grogu ate those eggs. He yeah. loved true, it. True, true. Yeah, he, I, I had a problem with Grogu about that. I still yeah. haven't forgiven. Meanwhile, yeah. Cassie and Andor's <laughs> killing motherfuckers left and right, and, and he's like, "No, it's well, not- well earned, motherfuckers. You don't go get drunk at a strip club and then try to then you try to you know mug somebody and be a bully. You deserve to die. Drunken we, we titty bar bullies deserve to die." Of Rob's uh, politics is coming through on the show <laughs> yeah. tonight. Drunken titty bar a- bullies deserve to die. Capital Rob- punishment across the board. It Damn. does not matter. Next, Rob's going to start telling us who's in charge of Hollywood, man. It's going to be fucking terrible. Anyway, so... Where is Harvey Weinstein when you need him? Oh, God. God. Movie that just came out. What, that was she, she said? Is that the Harvey Weinstein? Yeah, it came uh, out today, yeah. Jesus Christ, let's see that. Okay, gotcha. That, that anyway, I, really, I, really, I, I really like Gandor, and being you know, a very reasonable guy, I, I see all... I see the, the weight and validity of all people's opinions, except for these two numb nuts. And uh, yeah, go watch Andor. Yes, that's good. Two to one, you lose. I want to get more people on this show. Just to, <laughs> just clones to kind of back my ass. Uh, it's a good, it's a damn good show. Moving on, uh, talking about damn good shows. Uh, the thing that Rob wanted to do tonight is that he wanted us to rank our favorite MCU Disney Plus shows. Right? This was Chad's idea, by the way. I think I think it was Rob's idea. <laughs> It was my idea. I just, I just wanted to see Chad. What the fuck are you talking about? Gotcha. It was. Absolutely. Well, I know. What I'm remembering is Rob, maybe five months ago, said, we're going to start doing lists on this show. Uh, Can I lie? Here we are. Episode. Well, here we are. Uh, <laughs> look forward to that next episode, guys. <laughs> yeah. So, even had one planned. Oh, there God. have been nine MCU Disney Plus series. I'm going to list them off now. And then yeah, Chad, I only have eight on my list. So I have eight on my list enough. too. What the fuck? What's, 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 what's the nine? One in here. Yeah, I only, so, have, I only have eight. What the hell? So uh, the nine series have been One Division, The Falcon yep. and the Winter Soldier, yep. Loki. Yep. What if? Yep. I am Groot. Ah oh, shit! I am Groot. Hawkeye. Oh. She Hulk. Moon Knight and Miss Marvel. Now the question is: Do we include Disney special presentations in this list? 
Um, good question. So, so the special presentations are just it's Werewolf, werewolf by Night. Right? Yeah, Werewolf by Night. I'd say we don't include it. It's not like a, a show. It's almost no. like a movie. Yeah. Cool. All right. So those nine shows, we are now going to hear the rankings. Since, how do you want to do this? You want to go around with eight, everybody say their ninth, or do you just want one yeah, person? Let's roll that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I got to think about it for a second. Now that you added, I am Groot. I'm trying to fuck. I don't even know. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, go. Chad, you go first. Number nine is. So this is technically the worst. This is what you know what yeah. we're talking about. We're counting up. Uh, I have Moon Knight at number nine. Cool. Yeah. You know, I I would not much like Andor. I wouldn't have finished this if it hadn't been part of the MCU. Damn. Was it all the good acting, Chad? <laughs> that that bored you? Yeah, probably. I just he was great in that though. Yeah, Moon Knight's not real high on my list either, but he was Isaac was great. He was Again, excellent. This he was is excellent. one of those. This is one of those things where. The characters are better than the show, and I want to see these characters in better products. And thank God, because it's the MCU, we, we, we should be able to get to see his Moon Knight with different writers and a different director under different circumstances. So that's great. That's great. So um, what's your number nine? I'm going to say what if. Um, and again, like, like you said, I, 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 didn't, I didn't hate any of these shows. There's nothing hating about them. It's Again, somebody's got to be at the bottom. I'd say inconsistently with what, how many episodes, what if were there nine? Oh, I don't know. I, 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 think, I think so. I, yeah, I think, I think I really like four of them. A couple were okay. A couple of them had bored me to death. So I, I think, again, I, you know, I don't, I like the live action a lot better. They were fine. It was sort of a nice filler, but it didn't really do anything for me. Um, so I got what if it, uh, and, and I guess at nine, yeah. Yeah, uh, same for me. Number nine is What If. Now, again, I love all these shows. I love the fact that they got to do What If. Yeah. Um, the thing I like about the Zen Star Wars cartoon with Grogu from Studio Ghibli is that it sort of branches off into a different type of filmmaking. It's just pure experimental filmmaking. And I love when a franchise has the balls to do that. And this feels like the MCU's version of that. So I liked it. Um, but again, something has to be at the yeah. bottom. Uh, That's how I feel about it. I was, I was going to say, there were rumors the last couple of days that they're kind of looking again at Disney's animation because what if didn't do big numbers? And there was sort of a, uh, there was some, some rumors coming out that Chapek was thinking about pulling back budgeting on the animation, which may affect that Spider-Man series and the, and the X-Men 97, which I've never seen, but I heard it was great. It better not be affecting X-Men 97 is all I got to say. Uh, I hear you. Damn. Uh, Chad bringing out the big guns. Now, what's your number eight, Chad? Uh, now it is Groot after uh, I've just added it because I mean, it was fine. It was cute. You know, it wasn't a whole lot to it. They were shorts. They didn't have any ramifications whatsoever. You know, uh, no. it was fine. Yeah. Completely fine. Rob, what about yourself? Right there with Chad. Number eight is Groot. Yeah, they're cute. It was fun. I got to finally get to see all of them. They were like, it was pleasant. It was it was nice. The animation was cool looking. It was. I thought it, I thought it held up. Yeah. You know, as far as the tone of the movies, it was just you know, Baby Groot's not my favorite character in the MCU. It's cute. It's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. I I enjoyed it for a couple minutes. What's next? You know. Yeah. What about you? Uh, number eight for me is going to be Moon Knight. Now I I love the character. I love a lot of what the show did. Um, but this is the show for me that more than the others, I can feel the budget fucking with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of the shots that are supposed to be more epic, it feels more independent film, which is not a knock, but it is something that I, you know, I'm taking into consideration when I'm ranking these. Oscar Isaac is probably my, one of my favorite characters to be introduced in this phase, but uh, yeah, if I got to put it somewhere, it's number eight. Now, Chad, what about you for number seven? So now we're at the point where. I really enjoy all of these. So Moon Knight's fine. You know, I, it's fine. Group, I enjoy, but I really enjoy all of these. So this is not that it's tougher to rank them, but just because this is seventh doesn't mean it's, you know, bad. Yeah. it's kind of like what you were saying. Uh, for seven, I have what if. And, you know, it's largely due to the hit and miss nature of the yeah. shows. Some were much better than others. I did enjoy how they all came together and it was one cohesive story at the end. That, that was kind of cool. But yeah, there there's some good ones. There were some bad ones. But yeah, I, like you said, I love the concept of what if. And I, 
it's awesome that we got to see that in a cartoon. Okay. Uh, awesome. Uh, now, Rob, what about you for seven? Seven is Moon Knight for me. Um, you know, again, I thought I, Oscar Isaac, I could have watched him just work that character all day long. I, I thought I love the whole, the the dynamic with the mirrors and the different personalities. And they, they did, he did a lot of that, that practically. It was, um, I thought he was tremendous. I, but I think I felt about this show not, not too differently than what you guys feel a little bit about Andor. It's just, it felt a little bit like a slog. I, it just felt like it was kind of, kind of in place at times and it felt like it was stretched out and and this could have been a, I think a shorter series and it could have been a better series uh like that there were things I loved again well cast I mean they're getting the cream of the crop the pick of the litter uh actors and um which I think you know does a lot of, it carries a lot of the weight sometimes in these shows but um yeah but it was okay I look forward to seeing again that character in either in the next series where they where, where they make some changes or him in you know crossing over to some of the other uh, movies or series. Yeah. understood and my really. daughter actually thought this was her favorite out oh. of all the mcu shows she really loves moon knight interesting That's well awesome. i have to rethink this because her opinion i respect yeah i mean she's, yeah she's, you, you should she's yeah. something else she's yeah. the smart one of the group <laughs> yeah absolutely uh for me my number seven is the falcon and the winter soldier again i love these characters i felt yep. a little disappointed in the villain aspect of the story uh, I I wanted a little bit something more. Um, yeah, and I don't like the fact U.S. agent became a hero. That's just, if I'm being honest, I like it better as a villain. Uh, Chad, what, what do you got for number six? I feel like this is going to be a hot take for you guys, uh, but I'm going with Loki as number six. Yeah. Uh, yeah it was cool. Uh, the variants were cool. I was, I'm not a fan of that Kang, you know, uh, yeah. that version of Kang. Uh, and the ending just yeah we didn't know there was going to be a season two what have you but and to me it just didn't feel like a complete show like you know there's plenty of show seasons where they accomplish something by the end but there's more to do you know buffy yeah. things like that you know you beat the big bad you've completed that and i just i just didn't get that impression at all from loki it just seemed like it was the sixth episode of a 12 episode first yeah. season so yeah. because of that, it's a little bit lower for me. It's got a very Planet of the Apes ending. But uh, yeah, Rob, what about you for number six? So my next three, six, five, and four, to me all suffer from what um, we were just saying about sort of a weak villain, like you were just saying about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Mm -hmm. So my next one is, but my next three are where they are, I think, because of just the, the obstacle. The, 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 the villain was vague and... It just wasn't well defined. Uh, the Falcon and Winter Soldier is next for me. That being said, I really enjoyed this show, and this is one of the shows that the further I get away from it, the more the more favorably I look back on it. I really like, I really like those characters. I really like uh, Winter Soldier. He's he's so good at that character. I love I love I loved his performance in that. I really did like the arc of um, of um, U.S. Agent in that. I thought as much as I hated him at the beginning. I really grew to like that character and how he just, I felt like he just, he kept trying to gain control of the reins and, and ground him and ground him. And just, I, I really, I really, I mean, I really liked the show, but there again, it's, I think that show is victim of the pandemic and the rewrites that it had to go through. And it, it felt like there were just chunks taken out of it. Um, I did not like at all. I did not like the twist of what's her name being the, Power the broker. big bad power broke. I thought that was, boy, that was shoehorned in there and crammed in there. And it makes to me no sense timeline wise and, and who she was. That being said, the character of, of Nemo, um, not Nemo, Nemo? Zemo? No. Nemo, Jesus Christ. Nemo's no, a Nemo small fish. When, when, when Nemo, <laughs> when Captain Nemo from 20 Leagues Under the Sea, also a Disney product, that, came up listen, with his organ. That's old Rob. He said Captain Nemo. You went with Pixar, Pixar's Finding Nemo. There but, Cap, you go. but Rob also said 20 Leagues Under the Sea, which is not the same, but <laughs> it's not very deep. 20 seasons. I have your problems. Hey, season. I have your problems. I can't go that deep. 20 yeah. Leagues is just fine. Uh, <laughs> I did say 20 Leagues. Jesus Christ. What is, just, just put me out. Put me out the pasture for the love of Christ. Um, what was I saying? Um, Baron Zemo. Zemo. Again, what a great... I, he's not an anti-hero, I guess. I mean, he's just he's, he is a villain. But fuck, that, he's so good. 
Yeah. That's another character like we were just talking about uh, Namor or Namor. Um, he should be in everything. He is, if, if when they announced the, uh, not the Suicide Squad, not the Replaceables, the what? Thunderbolts. Thunderbolts. Thank you. I think they didn't announce everybody. I think it would be silly to announce everybody. And I think uh, uh, Captain Zemo will be one of the surprise announcements along with, um, who else am I thinking of? Spectral Vision and... Um... <laughs> yes. Yes, for the Andor, love of God. Cassie and Andor, he's got to be in it. Yeah. Who, 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 who were we talking about? A couple weeks ago, there was somebody else who was left Red, off. There. Red Hulk. No, 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 no. Abomination. No. Abomination, thank you. I think those two will show up because it's silly not to leave something open for oh shit surprise moments so yeah. uh uh zemo and abomination uh but zemo zemo back to uh to me he was one of the real shining lights of falcon and winter soldier oh absolutely. really really good and i did like uh bucky's work in that i mean everybody's good in it i mean nobody's doing bad work hell george uh george st pierre at the beginning as a uh, yeah as the French for, yeah it's, i mean it's all good stuff i think they were just a victim of of the times and could not just excise that part out and redo and redo the B story. So it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, for me, number six is I am Groot. Um, you know, it's not a very consequential show, but it is fun to watch. And sometimes you just like to have something carefree on in the background. I, uh, I've been watching bluey a lot on Disney plus recently, and it's fun sort of like charismatic show and it reminds me of i am group just a fun little romp adventure looney tunes s cartoon that i can laugh at in the background uh chad what do you got for number five well, number five is hawkeye i it was slow in moments but but it, it was overall it was really good you know Haley steinfeld was awesome florence pew incredible we got kingpin yeah you know what's not to love about it you know we're just getting we're just getting down to the wire you know yeah. I, I dug it it's just, you know, not quite as much as the other ones that are left. Absolutely. Rob, what about yourself? Before I move on to that one, one of, one of the things I didn't mean to leave off talking about Falcon and Winter Soldier, which was phenomenal, and I think overlooked at award season was Carl Lumley as, um, yeah. I Isaiah. mean, ho- holy shit. And talk about someone I would watch a spinoff series on, whether it's in the present day with flashbacks. I mean, I want to see a flashback where he, where he crosses paths with Wolverine, for Christ's sake. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, he was phenomenal. Um, the weight of that was great. Anyway, uh, my next is She-Hulk. Um, I, I thought again, well cast uh, in the lead. I thought it was tremendous. I thought the, the top three or four leads. Um, I don't have IMD open in front of me. Um, Tatiana Maslany, obviously great. I thought the real one of the real stars of the show was the the, uh, the actress playing her sidekick, her mm-hmm. uh, who was great in every scene. I talk about a comedic genius. Um, I think she's phenomenal. Again, sort of. It was sort of all over the place. I felt like they shuffled the deck sometimes and the episodes were out of order and there was no, I didn't know that they didn't know where they were going. Um, she's great. I get, I, I don't care about the, the inconsistencies of the special effects. I'm watching it for the story. I get that that's going to happen. That's fine. It just felt, boy, it just, it felt like it was of too many minds, not one vision. Um, uh, she was always good. There were, there were, there were really good moments in each episode. Um, I enjoy, it, but it was just, it was lacking something again. Another character that I want to see handled better in either either under a new direct, new directors or different showrunner. That being said, I've been bringing back Daredevil. To me, was worth the wait. I mean, that was great to see. Yeah. You know, knowing full well that, I, I mean, he's still got it, and that's going to be something fun to look forward to. And again, like like Chad said, we're in the, you know, we're in the top five here, so it's. I enjoy. I enjoyed them all. I said, "Oh, good, another She-Hulk episode on. Let's watch." And it was always okay. It's pretty good. I enjoyed it. It was it was comfort food in a way, but you know, that's where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, for me, number five. I'm the same with Chad Hawkeye. Uh, I liked Hawkeye. Jeremy Renner's never been my favorite of the Avengers. I've always liked his character. Fair enough, but I never want to go buy a Hawkeye T-shirts or anything like that. But I thought this show was super fun. It just maybe to me pendulumed back between television quality and cinematic quality a little bit too much uh some of the fight sequences felt very tv which is fine but i'm more accustomed to them feeling a little bit larger than that you know um but i love you know vince d'onofrio is my favorite actor 
So that was great to see. I love what they did with Echo. I love Kate Bishop. I love seeing Yelena. All that was great. Uh, but again, somebody's got to be at number five. Uh, yeah. Ch- Chad, what about you for number four? My number four is She-Hulk. Um, as I said on the podcast before, the sensational She-Hulk, that's what this was. This was, to me, the most comic accurate, as crazy as it was. And as her talking to the creators and things like that, to me, is the most comic accurate thing I've seen out of Marvel. Uh, it, you know, it was just well done. They took big swings. Didn't always hit home runs, but number four for me, she hope. What about you, Rob? I would go number four, Miss Marvel. Again, the last three, uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, She-Hulk, and Miss Marvel. I thought I thought we just, uh, I mean, the, the lead characters were great and all the characters were great. I just um, lacking in in the bad guy area, <laughs> lacking in the villain. Uh, those felt very rushed. There was some really weird, you know, turn on a dime from I'm going to help you to I'm going to kill you type moments. Um, that being said, I, I think a, a revelation in the lead actress uh, finding Iman Vellani. Um, I, I, I literally, if anybody's ever been born to play a role, shit, I, I, I thought she was amazing in it. Um, the casting of her family, it was, I enjoyed, I could have watched just her family dealing with her the entire time and not venturing outside the family. It was that enjoyable. Um, um, I loved, I thought the, a couple of the directors really, I thought were really great visionaries, how to use, really finding interesting ways how to use uh, social media to communicate by using the, the whole uh, palette of the screen to, to do that where we didn't have to look at phones. Just very entertaining and, and interesting. And uh, and for the most part, I enjoyed the shit out of it. It was beautifully shot. So, I, I mean, I really did like it. Had this show had a better written, more substantial um, uh, uh, antagonist, I think it would have uh, been even higher. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, for me, number four is Loki. Uh, I love the show. I love the Doctor Who vibes it gives off. Um, but kind of what to what Chad said, like I, I, I felt a little bit of something lacking. Um, it didn't necessarily bother me that it didn't feel as complete. I just, while it was new, I think the other three shows are a little bit more new and fresh to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they just caught my attention span a little bit more. Uh, Chad, what do you have for number three? Number three, I have Falcon and Winter Soldier. This one was the to me most mcue show out of all of them yeah and you know we love the mcu i know they yep. play with genres and things like this but this one felt like it was a movie in the mcu yeah. you know yeah. there was a, a villain issue in that one but it depends on who you're talking about as the villain because i loved us agent i thought yeah. his arc was incredible yep. so you know and that one to me also has repercussions we're setting up the Thunderbolts in that, um, you know, Falcon is not Falcon anymore. He's Captain America. So we got a little bit with uh, Isaiah, the truth comic, some of that in the past that could come into play, things like that. So uh, it was in the Marvel world, the MCU world, and it has repercussions going forward. So I dug yeah, it. Great points. Uh, Rob, what about yourself for number three? Three, I'm at Loki. Um, I thought just a fun... Uh, well-produced, well-written show. Um, I, I love this. Um, oh, I thought Owen Wilson really mm-hmm. stole the show. And again, not like, and everybody else was great. Uh, again, you know, Tom Hiddleston, another actor who's really taken ownership of a role and protected it and just grown with it and taken it in so many different directions. Uh, talk about just, uh, you know, having nine lives. Um, and just a fun story. I really thought there was only one episode that kind of dragged for me. And I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed uh, the energy of it and the fun and the relationships. Uh, unlike Chad, I did like, again, I'm not, again, comic book wise, I'm not that attached to Kang. I don't know much about him, but I'm a huge fan of Jonathan Majors. And um, that was fun to see him get to play and, and just knowing what's to come down the road of him playing many different versions of that. I thought it was a great way to end it, but uh, I enjoyed the shit out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, number three is Miss Marvel. I really, really, you know, I, I agree there's a villain issue with it, but the 
the feeling of the show, the tone of the show was so fun. Yeah. It was so fresh. And I feel like Aman Vellani is that same type of kismet casting as Christopher Reeve as Superman, as Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool. These people naturally have this charm that is so electrifying. And she has that, you know? Um, and so just following her character and getting excited not only for the character of Kamala Khan, but also for her as the actress. To see her live out her dreams is almost like this meditative thing that I really enjoyed doing. Um, so yeah, uh, number two for you, Chad, where are you at? Number two is Miss Marvel. Uh, a lot of the same reasons, yeah. you know, you had Keith. I agree, there's a villain issue, but to me, it almost doesn't matter because this is Spider-Man. I said it before, it's a better Spider-Man than Spider-Man. It, it's yeah. the Spider-Man comic brought to life, basically. <laughs> Spider-Man had amazing villains, but it was also about his supporting cast. It was about his problems in the world that he has. Yeah. So because of that, yeah, I dug this show a lot. This, this was really good. This is top tier right here, Marvel, Miss Marvel for me. Cool. Rob, what about you? Uh, I have a, this is a toss up for one and two of these two shows. Uh, um, I'm going to have WandaVision as two, but it could have been it could have been one. WandaVision, uh, the first of the Disney Plus series, was so much fun and so clever and and just literally had me on the edge of my seat every week. What is happening? What is going on? What is what is around the corner? Um, it was a fun little mystery. It was tense. Um Watching these two go toe to toe with each other and work together, in addition to uh, you know the, the world really getting full fledged Catherine Hahn and seeing how special she is, I just I can't I I was so excited that anything that that came after it mm -hmm. was going to be hard pressed, I think to live up to that. That's yeah. that's that's how good that freaking show is. That show is so good. I think uh, the multiverse of madness had a tough time living up to it because. She was such a presence in it. And they didn't really, I, I don't think they tied it into that enough. I just knocked everything off my table. Hey, cool. Um, I love the show. Yeah, yeah, show. me too. Uh, I, it's number two on my list as well, but it easily could have been number one. I think as a start to this era of the Disney Plus shows, what a big fucking hit that is to start Ooh. off with this. No and, shit. And also, like, I love the fact it. A, I feel none of the other Disney Plus shows have managed to utilize the medium to the extent that this does. Not only giving these actors a chance to shine in these very open characters that get to experience so much, but also playing and talking about the format of television itself. And then also breaking down and becoming iconoclastic against what a superhero television show or movie has to be. Instead of it just being about fighting the big bad, this is a metaphysical, again, study of grief. And that's great because so many of the Marvel comics that I love, Earth X, uh, you know, so many Doctor Strange comics I love in general, uh, Saga of Swamp Thing, they're not just about punching. They're about these big questions about, like, how do we live? What is life? I saw a write-up yesterday that postulizes that the entirety of phase four has just been an exploration of vision's question. What is grief? But you know, the love thing. And, and that totally tracks for me because every single one of these shows deals with loss and, and reclaiming yourself and, and, and being reborn in a new version. So yeah, to me, one division, I think it's just high art. I, I, I love it immensely. Uh, now we're getting to the big ones, the winners, Chad, what is your number one Disney Plus MCU show? Number one is WandaVision for a lot of the reasons yeah. you already said. It's incredible. It's literally the reason why we started this podcast. Yeah. Is because we have to talk about this show. It's incredible. that What it's doing every week, the subversions of sitcoms, each decade, how they went through it. What I loved it. It was so good. And much like some of the other ones that I had near the top repercussions, this movie led into, you know, Dr. Strange, but her motivation was because of the children she had and what she lost 
in this movie. Granted, she lost vision earlier, but this is the full picture and what she is really going for in a, a Marvel movie is all about this. It's almost like required watching for the yeah. MCU. Yeah. It, it, it's so good. It's like you said, they, they do so many different things just from start to finish. I, yeah, I can't praise this show enough. I love it. Hands down the best MCU movie for me. I, and it also, it reminds me really quick of that a quote Mbaku has in Black Panther. Life has taken too much from you for you to be a child. Like that, and that sort of same idea to Wanda. Wanda has lost so much in this world that we're just watching a person try to deal with it. And the consequences of not being able to deal with it are the Hex and Doctor Strange. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, Rob, what about you? What's the number one MCU Disney Plus show? And and for the and for a different reason than WandaVision could be number one, where this show just I just smiled the whole damn time. I, I literally it just I was in a good mood from beginning to end watching this watching the show. And this is Hawkeye, and I know you guys have much uh, further down. Um, but I, I know you said you know Hawkeye's never been your old favorite character. I, I feel like the difference in this show, as opposed to um, all those other appearances. He sort of became the reluctant hero in this show. And, I, and I've always loved a good reluctant hero story telling. He didn't want to do this. He didn't want to fight. He didn't want to have to deal with this. He didn't want to have to deal with Kate Bishop. He didn't want to have to deal with, with uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. He, did, he just, it was that world weary for the love of God until he changes and gets back in the game. Um, Florence Pugh. Um might be the best actor in the, in the in the MCU. She, you talk about charisma, and just I don't know if I've seen someone who looks like they're enjoying acting as much as she looks like she enjoys playing a part, as in this this and Black Widow. How just what a fucking ball she's having, and it's just it's contagious. I just I love to watch her play Haley Steinfeld. Um, again, I, I think the casting is dead on yeah dead. and again even the even the russians and they're the russian uh the the tracksuit mafia the i've uh, got peter piotr adam the guy who played thomas just funny and a little silly but not too crazy silly linda cardellini's phenomenal i just i just had a ball with this show um and of course the christmas music yeah, yeah, I was going to say that's a very extensive yeah. way to say yeah. I like Christmas music. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote that down because I was I was coming with a Christmas music. I knew you guys were coming with it. That's why I dropped it there. That's yeah. how you have to do it. You got to steal your gotta thunder, baby. Oh, got to steal make, your thunder. You're going to make fun of my small dick next. I got I to gotta say something about that real fast. <laughs> and and just so you guys, uh, the sp small dick. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody small knows dick. it. Okay, guys? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. I have a really you have a weird relationship with my small dick. So, yeah. Do you, so. do you think starting into the galaxy, the Christmas special will replace it? Because I'm sure it's going to have Christmas music in it. It'll oh, certainly shit. be a one. one oh, oh, shit. Oh, snap. Yeah. It's coming. I'm going to have to restructure my top three. But that's that's a special presentation, though. So right? that way, okay. So then that'll oh, be number one go. against werewolves. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. No matter what, it's going to be number. That's one right. Werewolf. Screw you, werewolf by night. You're going to Christmas music. Hawkeye was my daughter's least favorite show. So. Oh shit! See that really that, bo that bothers me. That really bothers. me. You know me. what? Secretly, uh, not secretly. Uh, low key, outwardly, yeah, outwardly, yeah. And clearly, nobody low likes key, you. Rob. I think she's not a fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, she just said, whatever Rob says on the podcast is his number one. Make it my least favorite. Oh, gotcha. Did she say that? <laughs> no. Oh, I'm so naive when it comes to yeah. she, It's, it's no. so important for me to have her, 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 her to like me. <laughs> no, Loki, I think uh, my daughter cannot stand Haley Steinfeld, regardless of what she does. I love Haley oh, Steinfeld. Well, oh, that's just a yeah. kind of teenage I, I, I think thing. that's probably what it is. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, okay. It was her least favorite. Uh, okay. My favorite, my number one is uh, She-Hulk. And it's because I had such a blast watching it. Like, here's the thing. I love any franchise that can consistently reinvent itself, that can find new avenues of its own world to sort of explore. And that's exactly what She-Hulk does. The same thing that Chad said, it is comic accurate to it. Sometimes it's fault, its own detriment. But as a comic book fan, I love the balance it was able to forge 
with its comedic styles and and deep intrinsic uh, moments that seem to come out of nowhere that if you're not in for the ride you'll miss um i i love you know i love for love and thunder because i like how the issue of cancer sort of hits you in the face in the middle of all this zany yeah. comedy. And she Hulk sort of does the same thing a lot where it is this woman analyzing her own struggles and it doesn't have to fit the formula of a re- regular comic book film. And to me, that's just a blast. I had a wonderful time watching it. Um, Literally two of my favorite line readings, two of my favorite deliveries of lines are in that movie. When she- when she's talking about it, I smash, you know, I smash this, I smash, sometimes I smash, you know, Matt Mur- it's such an unbelievable delivery. And when she's talking to Kevin and she goes, what do we get, what do we get next, man? And she kind of looked at the camera with the thumbs up and the, and the tongue, like, oh, I got your back. I was like, that just, I, it, again, I just, I, I can watch that just, oh my God, she is oozing yeah. that charm. It was perfect yeah. in her yeah, delivery absolutely. and some of those things. Oh. Absolutely. And, and I love seeing her play in that world. I love the Kevin Feige oh. joke. I love Daredevil. Wong, Wongers, all of that. Uh, what's her name? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, her. She's, she's awesome. amazing. Yeah. You, that girl, you're going to see her a lot. And she's going to get a lot of offers to play those types of parts. But yeah. they got you got to bring her back. Just in the, She can show up in the MCU anywhere, and I think people would pop a little bit. Just like, the big Secret Wars in-game moment. All of a sudden, Madison comes in Madison. with a drink to fight. <laughs> yeah. Hey, <laughs> Rob! Please never do that again. Um. So, uh, hey, you guys remember my belt? Hey. Oh God, gross, <laughs> gross. That's what we call a callback. Yeah, <laughs> that's also what we call terrifying. But speaking of scary uh, things, Rob has to hang out for a little bit longer because we are going to do something Chad and I do every year. We do a thirty-one for thirty-one, meaning we watch thirty-one movies for the month of Halloween. Granted, go, I, do it. I'm going I'm to go pee real fast and come back. You guys do that. I'll okay, be right back. Yeah, okay, um, okay. I'm glad the world the world now knows about Rob's bladder cycle. Uh, <laughs> So we realize it is now November 20th ish and uh, we're now doing this thing that we did in October, but uh, fuck Rob. Anyway. So um, here's how we're going to do this. Chad's going to list off his movies uh, just straight lightning style. Give me a sentence about what it's about and a sentence about what you thought about it. Um, We can discuss if some uh, reach our minds, Um, but yeah, we're just going to try to go through this kind of quickly. And Chad's going first because he watched like 44 uh, cause he's an overachiever. Yeah. But that's only because you watch a series. I don't I watch series during, during yeah. this. So we probably watch the same amount of hours. Uh, first was, uh, the monsters. We've already talked about that monstrosity yep. on the show. Uh, and all of these are movies I've never seen before. So it's not yep. like I'm not, I don't have a rewatch in, I mean, I did rewatch some, but it's not in my list. So yep. I've never seen some of what I'm listening off. Uh, from 1982, House on Sorority Row, slasher flick. Yeah. Uh, it, it was fine. You know, whatever. For what it was. Uh, the 2014 remake, requel, reboot of The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Oh. I like the idea of that. Have you seen that before, Keith? I've seen the original. I haven't seen the new one. What's cool about this one is the premise is that it's set in the world where the murders really happened, which, of course, the murders really did happen. But it's set in the, in the world where the original movie that you saw came out. And the town has seen that movie and they have festivals every year showing that movie. And now there's a copycat killer of the original copycat of the. Oh movie. shit. So okay. It's clever. Yeah. You know, it doesn't deliver totally, yeah. but it's clever in, in that idea. Hocus Pocus two. We talked about that, uh, you know, on the podcast insidious chapter three. Uh, I have not seen that one before. I'd like the first two insidious is this one, not so much, but this one didn't have the original cast. Uh, gotcha. Rose Byrne and all them back. Uh, the next one, this is probably the, my favorite one that I watched the entire uh, Halloween thing was Villains, 2019's Villains with uh, Bill Skarsgård and Micah Monroe. And it's awesome. Rob can attest to this back uh, with, I, I do not like Jeffrey Donovan as an actor. Yeah. I've, I've never really liked him. And uh, it might be because of Blair Witch 2. I was just going to say, I love Book of Shadows. Yeah, I, I, I think you're about, not going to watch R.I.P.D. too. But. Yeah. So I'm not a fan of his. And Rob's like, hey, you need to watch Burn Notice. Burn Notice. I was like, I'm not watching that show. I, I love that show. It. Yeah, I can't stand Jeffrey Donovan. 
He's incredible in this movie. He has awesome. won me over in this movie. He is awesome. Awesome. He is he's chewing scenery, but he's awesome. So now Great. I'm on board with Jeffrey Donovan. I may re, I may go back and watch uh, Burn Notice, Rob. Do it. So what, what show was that again? What movie was that with Jeffrey Donovan? You just said I missed Villains. Okay. From 2019. It also has okay. Bill Skarsgård and Micah Monroe in it, but it's excellent. Oh, is that the one where is that the one where he, they break into the house? Yep. Yep. I saw that when it came out. Keith, you know what? That's not unlike. What? Um, it's not unlike. You got to watch it. It's not unlike what the fuck we made. Um, uh, crazy, 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 crazy. It's it's oh, got sure. a similar storyline to Crazy, to Crazy. Yeah, I de- I'm, definitely got Crazy, Crazy vibes. Sure. I was watching that going. Somebody with money made Crazy to Crazy. You sons of bitches. <laughs> I remember thinking that going. God damn it. Yeah, Jeffrey Donovan did a much better version of you, Rob. It was incredible <laughs> how much better he was. Well, he is you. Jeffrey Donovan. Yeah. I mean, Early you know, Witch Project Two, Book of Show- Shadows. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's if I'm going to be imitated and bettered, I'm. It's going to be by the cream of the crop. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next was Hotel Transylvania, uh, the, the yeah. cartoon with Adam Sandler. You know, fine. Uh, next one's pretty good. 2007 Time Crimes. It's a foreign film. Uh, I could I don't remember if it's Sweden, but time travel horror. Awesome. Well worth checking out. Yeah. Time crimes. Uh 2020's The Wolf of Snow Hollow. It was pretty cool. A twist on a werewolf movie, but again, as I've said before, you don't like werewolf not really movies. any great werewolf movies. Well, no. this one was it was pretty good. Uh Deadstream, talked about it on the podcast. Uh 2005's Doom with The Rock. Yeah, uh, Carl Urban, yeah. Yeah, Carl Urban. There's a lot of people in that movie, yeah. actually. Yeah. Uh, it was fine, you know, as far as that goes. Um, I always try to watch a Disney original. Uh, this one was Halloween Town High, the third. The third Halloween. of the films, yeah. Yes, fine. They, whatever. <laughs> Hellraiser, we talked about it on the podcast. I never saw the 1963 classic The Haunting, so I watched that. It's one of my favorite movies, Robert Wise. Uh, what what's crazy about that is the not the lead but the other lady in that i'm watching this movie and i'm thinking like this lady's a lesbian in a 1963 movie like is that really what they were doing and i and i googled it halfway through the movie because i was like am i just reading this wrong it's like no she's like a gay icon yeah yeah it was awesome especially by the guy who made west side story and like all of these classic films I, the Haunting, wow. based on The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, one of my favorite movies of all time. Can't, I love that movie. Yep. Yeah. Uh, next, speaking of uh, Jeremy Renner, uh, Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters. Oh, I, yeah. saw, I saw it. I saw it. Yeah. It was ridiculous yeah. and fun. Yeah. Ridiculous yeah. and fun. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Werewolf by Night. We talked about it on the podcast. Uh, I always try to watch a Stephen King. This one was Cat's Eye, because then I can watch uh, Stephen King and an anthology at the same time. Yeah. Some were better, you know, than, than others. others they but yeah it was fine uh the 2021 remake of slumber party massacre oh i haven't seen that one yet uh what i like about this one it twists the original on its head it's a slumber party massacre but it's directed by a woman and i think maybe written by a woman as well but it is the opposite of male gaze there are guys in this it's about girls but anything that it shows gratuitous are guys in the cabin next door the guys in the cabin next door have a pillow fight with their shirts off halfway that's through the awesome. movie. Even though people are dead, one of the guys goes, that's cool. I'm going to go take a shower. And we see him like, literally he takes a shower for like three minutes and then that's gets awesome. killed in the shower, you know? So <laughs> that's awesome. Overall did not work, but I love what they were trying to do. Yeah. yeah. It, it was, it was a great, you know, yes. genre bending. Uh, next was a uh, repo, the genetic opera. opera. Yeah. Not a fan of this. Me but. Yeah, it's just it's just too much. Like, but it's, it's got a uh, Rob's uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer yeah, it's icon. Got Giles, yeah, yeah. I mean, and uh, he, I mean, he's great. I like his singing voice, whatever. I, I don't mind that it's a musical, but this was just too too outlandish uh, for me. Uh, Two thousand twenty slacks about a pair of killer pants on Shutter. Nice, it's amazing. Slacks, yeah. nice. Yeah. So check it out, Keith. 1960s Village of the Damned. I like the yeah. fact that the last one is not even like a it's not even like a twist on like something dangerous. It's slacks. It's just like the oldest yeah. way you can describe pants. Slacks. Yeah. And it's spelled with uh X two, two X's. Nice. Two. Nice. That one. Uh the next one was Halloween Ends. We talked about it on the podcast. Yep. We puked. Next one, Keith. I texted you about this one. Assassination Nation. 
Yeah, you did. Check it out. Okay, you, I will. You got to check that one out. Uh, although Villains is my favorite, this one was very well done. It says something about, you know, social media today and privacy and badass lead girls. Excellent. Awesome. Uh, 2020's Tremors, Shraker Island. Yeah. I love the Tremors movies. I love Tremors. They're all so good. Like, so good. The first one is like legitimately an excellent movie. Yep. And the rest are just fun. But yeah. The rest are fun. This the last one I one. saw it was not very good. The guy from uh, um Michael Gross from Family Ties, I'm sure is what you're talking no, about. No, no, I love Michael Gross from Family oh. Ties. Good lord, who are you talking about? I grew up with Family Ties. Well, he's in all of them. That's why I thought you were no the guy who took over the lead. Um uh they were like on an island and uh I think that's they, the they one he's talking about. You mean you mean yeah. <laughs> that the one? striker island? Oh, is that what it's called? Okay, got you guys. I yeah, he took that. over John Heater talking about yeah, the dynamite. Terrible. I couldn't even get through it. It was terrible. That is uh it's the last, I think it's the late, the most oh, recent one in the series. Awful. I think there's, a, is it after the ice storm one? Yeah, I think I saw the one where they're like in Antarctica or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Next one, it's got two titles, Dead Man's Curve or The Curve from 1998. Matthew Lillard's in it. Yeah. Off the screen uh, thing. It's kind of like Dead Man on Campus, but yeah. a little more dark. Keith, yeah. you love, you love Matthew Lillard. I do love Matthew Lillard. You have talked about Matthew Lillard. It he's was, great. Uh, just, yeah. He's one of the nicest guys you will ever meet in your life. I worked with him on Good Girls. Fantastic person. You know, I you can you think that about some actors and their dicks, or you think some actors are dicks and they're not. But I feel that with Matthew Lillard. I feel like he seems like he's a genuine nice guy. My, my favorite thing about just really quick, uh, I Twin Peaks is my favorite television show of no. all time. And, yeah. And so Matthew Lillard is in the reboot of Twin Peaks. And I was wearing, I went to the lunch uh, script reading for my first you know, day of work. And I was wearing a Twin Peaks shirt that said, the owls are not what they seem. And uh, Matthew is like looking at me from across the cafeteria. And he's like reading my shirt. And he's like, why? And he walks up to me. And he's like, why does that sound familiar? I'm like, because you said it in a TV show. And he's like, <laughs> oh, okay. And just, we had a lovely conversation afterwards, but go ahead. You know, you choosing that shirt really paid off. Yeah, absolutely. It's unbelievable. And it was you're a like, random I'm, choice shirt. <laughs> I don't think it was random. You know, some like like in high school, you're like, you know, I'm going to wear this shirt. This girl's going to walk up to me like, you look so hard. <laughs> that was Keith. He's like, I know I'm going to do this read through with Matthew Lillard. This is the perfect shirt. I He's going to come up to me and ask <laughs> There's me no <laughs> way that was not planned. Yeah, I did not a chance in hell. No, but this was my first day, so I had no idea who was even in the show. I just oh, happened to wear yeah, it. Yeah, you never do your research. Yeah. You're the most, oh, yeah. I, I'm going to do uh, a read through with uh, Christopher Lloyd. I'm wearing a, a shirt of like the DeLorean. Yeah, like, exactly. Oh, weird. Oh, weird. Oh, well, it's, I didn't even it's, think. it's crazy. <laughs> Well, anyway, you want to talk about the movie? We'll, we'll talk about it. You want to be best friends? We'll have lunch. Let's go. That's so funny. It paid off totally. Yeah. Nice work. Uh, next one was 2020's Resolution. Very low budget. Have you heard of this movie, Keith? I feel mm -hmm. like it'd be up your alley. Super low budget, but people rave about it. I mean, it's a part of some other cinematic universe. Oh, Resolution. I think, yeah. I, I watched, I think, the first one of the this one? series. The one? Endless. Yeah. Endless. Yep. Yeah, that's what okay. the other one is for sure. Oh, yeah, somebody told me to watch Resolution, but I haven't yet. But I, the Endless is in mine, but go ahead. Because, yeah, I was thinking, I've got to watch the Endless now. Uh, next was uh, the latest installment of the Bring It On Cheerleader series. This was on Sci Fi Bring It On, Cheer or Die. They merged the <laughs> Bring It On series with a slasher flick. Nice. And it's horrible, but. <laughs> That's what it is. It's That's bring amazing. It on with slashers. Uh, next, uh, directed by Ty West, 2009's The House of the Devil. Love that movie so much. Very creepy, atmospheric. Yeah. Very good. The lead's awesome. Yeah. Um, and Greta Gerwig's in it as well. So that is not long enough, though, no. for my liking. Um, Adam's Family 2 from uh, 2021, the animated, the animated one. one yeah. Which we, you talked about it at some point. You didn't yeah. like it. That, I mean, it's fine. Uh, VHS 99. Uh, 1943's Alfred Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt. Yes. Oh. Always got to have a Hitchcock in there, you know, hopefully one I haven't seen. This is like, this is super cool too. Uh, very creepy. Yeah, yeah, I dug that one. Uh, 2018 Slice is A24 film. Did not like it too much. No, you didn't like an A24 movie? Nope. Is, that, is that the first one? 
it stars Chance the Rapper. Uh, he was fine oh. in it, but I just didn't. I didn't really like the. I didn't I like it. it. Oh, Zazie Beats was in that. Yeah. Zazie Beats, she's in it as well, but yeah, wasn't a fan. Uh, Curse of Bridge Hollow, we talked about. Uh, 2013's Willow Creek, directed by Bobcat. Ah, uh, Bobcat Go for it. Oh my God. It, wow. it, it's kind of like you know they're trying to do the Blair Witch. It's not anywhere near as good as the Blair Witch, obviously, but it is what it is. Mm-hmm. My best friend's Exorcism, nineteen seventy-seven Japanese film. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right. House, House. Say House. Yeah. House yeah, I just got that on Criterion Collection. It's a great movie. Oh, yeah. so you wasted your money? Okay, uh, moving <laughs> on. Uh, 2020 Psycho Goreman on. Um, Shutter. Uh-huh. This is what if um what am I thinking of? Just old school Power Rangers TV show meets gore and killing. Yeah, so absolutely. That yeah, that's what that was. 1989's Prom Night Three, The Last Kiss. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Prom Night Two is actually not bad. Is that it, Prom Night know, Two Hello Mary Lou or whatever it is? Hello Mary Lou is not bad. This one is not good. Uh the Idris Elba film Beast, not bad. Okay. Yeah, I dug it. It's kind of like Jaws. Yep. Uh, 2010's Black Death with Sean Bean. Ooh. This this looked like Game of Thrones and it had so many ex Game of Thrones in, or I say ex, but so many Game of Thrones actors in it. I thought I was watching Game of Thrones. That's so funny. It worked. Uh, 2009's The Descent Part Two. Yeah. I. I love The Descent. The Descent is one of my favorite horror movies of all time. It, is, it genuinely awesome. is terrifying. Awesome. It's awesome. And I've, everybody said this is shitty. And I didn't you know, think it'd leave up. And it doesn't live up. To whatever. But it's still it's not, not a bad, bad. Movie. No, I, no, I like the twist at the end of two is interesting that they're feeding them and all that shit. That's a cool little... Uh, and, yeah. I was just saying, one of the things that I really liked about it, though, and you don't really see it in horror movies with a sequel like this, since they go back to the scene of the crime, and you know, police haven't cleaned anything up because it's in a cave. The dead bodies are still there. Yeah, you know, and they take part in like what happens in part two. So I kind of like that as an idea. Yeah, it was fine. It's just you know, the descent is classic, unbelievable top horror. So, yeah. and yeah. there's no way this could live up to it. But it is. It's okay. I liked it. I thought it was yeah. fine. different. Different director. Okay, so not the same yeah. director. No. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, next, this was a, a fan film. Uh, Friday Thirteenth fan film. Jason Rising. Okay. Uh, it had the original final girl in it not through the whole thing she shows up kind of at the end yeah it kind of like a cameo role not quite but it has jason's mom in it jason you know it's good you know that's cool you could do a lot worse for a fan film uh 2012's vamps with alicia silverstone and mm. Kristen ritter mm-hmm. you know it's like uh, sex in the city but with vampires but it did pull it off um 1997 cube cube is awesome classic classic yeah i knew that people said it's a class i was like i gotta watch that that was yeah, on my list so to watch. good it's very well done i know there's sequels uh, have you seen the sequels or any of them any good keith i've or? seen a couple of the sequels they they suffer from hellraiser syndrome where some of them are are have some shining moments but nothing will ever live up to that first one and uh my last one uh I ended with Scooby Doo and Batman: Brave and the Bold. Fuck yeah, it's a great one. A ton of, I mean, like Scooby Doo's interacting with all the Batman villains. Absolutely, you know, I mean, it's a joke, but that's what Brave and the Bold was. I love, yeah. I love the Brave and the Bold cartoon, and I love the the original Scooby Doo crossover with Batman. It's one of my favorite things oh, of yeah. all time. The the cookies look so good. The bat cookies that Batman feeds them. Um, well, that's a good list. That's a monumental list. Let me dive into mine. I don't have as many as you do, um, but it's not a, a size competition i guess um so uh my first one is the monsters which we talked about and it was shitty my second one is the gate uh starring steven dorf i'd always heard this was a classic and it was meh it's not my favorite uh my third is a new movie uh the invitation which is a sort of like a dracula sort of uh, story it was fine uh my fourth one is the poughkeepsie tapes um which came out in 2008 i really really like this one uh, this is one of those where I'm shocked that they don't have a sequel to it. It's sort of a found footage mockumentary about trying to track down a serial killer movie. Really fun. Hocus Pocus 2. We talked about that on the podcast. 
Freeway with Reese Witherspoon and Kiefer Sutherland. Uh, yep. fuck, fuck that movie. That movie's wow. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, next, I watched Daisy Edgar Jones and Sebastian Stan in Fresh uh, on Hulu. Absolutely loved this movie. Uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, next, I watched The Collingswood Story, which is a movie told entirely over webcams, and it's fucking horrible. Uh, then I watched uh, Werewolf by Night, which I loved. Talked about that on the podcast. Then I watched Don't Worry, Darling. We talked about that on the podcast as well. Um, my next one was, hold on, I'm trying to find the rest of them. Give me a second. I should have bought myself more time. Hellraiser on Hulu, uh, the, the newest one. We talked about that on the podcast. The next, I watched The Endless, which again, it's a part of that cinematic universe you were talking about. Super low budget, but high concept science fiction. Um, it's about... These two brothers who used to be in a cult got out of the cult. They're going back to visit the cult one more time. I, I loved it. I thought it was so creative and clever, um, especially for being an independent film. Uh, I likewise try to watch a couple of Disney originals. Um, I watched Under Wraps 2, uh, which I think came out this year. Um, it's okay. It's eh. um, Then I watched uh, the... Stendhal Syndrome by Dario Argento um, starring his daughter uh, who is arguably the most gorgeous woman in the world um, but the movie's just really fucked up and it hurt my brain uh, then I watched One Must Fall which is a relatively indie film starring Barry Piacente uh, who's a local actor here uh, Barry's great in it the movie's terrible uh, what's it called? One Must Fall okay uh, then I watched Halloween Ends, which we talked about how terrible that is. I watched Dahmer Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story, which we talked about that. I watched Smile. We talked about that. I watched Mr. Harrigan's Phone. We talked about that. I talked. I watched Dario Argento's Dark uh, Glasses, which we talked about that as well. Um, and let me get to my next little section. I watched The Love Witch, uh, which I fucking loved. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy, but talk about a movie that captures an aesthetic. Like, everything about this movie looks like it's shot in the 70s. Uh, and you know they're using modern cameras, but they just nail it. They nail that 70s British erotic horror vibe so well. And the movie itself isn't scary. The girl is fine as fuck. But, yeah, like... She's, she's pretty awesome. Yeah, and it's just a really well-made film. VHS 99, we just talked about Elvira's Haunted Hills. I watched that for the first time, and it's super campy. Um, just Elvira going on an adventure. It's got Richard O'Brien, the creator of Rocky Horror Picture Show, plays a character in it. Um, it's just weird and fun. I watched Inner Sanctum Mystery, which the Inner Sanctum stories were a comic book in the 1920s, I want to say, and then a radio show, and then Universal made like eight movies based on them. Universal lost the rights, and then this one came out from another studio. And it's okay. It's got a really great twist, a wraparound twist of this film, um, but it's an all right film. Uh, old school, 1950s release. Uh, then I watched Ty West's X. I'd never seen that before. Um, and I really, it's good. It's good. I like House of the Devil more. Um I'm interested to see everyone in this movie is way too attractive. Uh, everyone is way too attractive. <laughs> and and it's about porn. So I felt uncomfortable the entire time. You know what I mean? Um, and I thought there would be a reason for Mia Goth to be playing both characters, but there's not. So, but I'm interested to see Pearl and Maxine and see, you know, what those lead to. Um, I watched another Disney film called Mr. Boogity. That was dumb. I watched The Watcher, which is another Netflix uh, series. The first couple episodes are phenomenal. The last episode is oh, like listening to Rob talk about Andor. Just fucking painful. <laughs> uh, I watched a Netflix horror film called The Old Ways, which is a exorcism movie, but set in Mexico. And it's instead of Christian versions of, of demon, demonology and stuff. It's old mass uh, Aztec uh, versions of that. And it was a really great watch. I highly recommend the old ways. Um, I watched Tokyo Gore Police, which is a Japanese splatter film that's just fucked up. Uh, it's just really fucked up. I watched this Canadian movie called Jikarag, which is about a Viking settlement in, I think, Saskatchewan. And um, that's haunted by like these 
spirit demons and it's like two and a half hours and it's fucking awful it feels like a middle school was trying to do a play of the witch um and it's just not good uh then i watched a uh, manhattan baby which is a italian uh horror film it's a part of those Babel films where everybody's speaking a different language and they all get dubbed and yeah. It's fucking just dumb. I mean, it's got some cool images, but it's I don't know what's happening. It's by the same guy that did Zombie and Zombie 3, uh, those famous Italian horror movies. Uh, then I watched uh, Resurrection with Rebecca Hall and Tim Roth on Shudder. And great movie. What a mind fuck. I don't know. I can't recommend this movie enough if you want to see phenomenal acting. But Tim Roth is the most disturbing I've ever seen him. Rebecca Hall is just a fearless actress. And she produced this. I think she had a hand in writing it. And she's phenomenal in it. But Tim Roth is so unsettling. And the movie in itself is so disturbing. It's just hard to get through at times. Guillermo de Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. I talked about that. Wendell and Wilde. I talked about that. And the last one I watched was uh, Justin Long in House of Darkness by uh, Neil Labute which is Neil Butte's version of the Dracula Bride story. Um, and it's a nice little self-contained piece. It's primarily one location, a lot of conversation, but it's nice. It's a cool little character piece. And Justin Long, uh, as always, plays a dickbag. So that's fun. Um, so, you know, good stuff. So that's our 31 for 31. Uh, Chad listed 75 of them, but that's totally fine. And, that's a uh, lot of movies. That's a lot. We had to make up for Rob watching zero for 31. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did I watch? Did I watch any horror movies this year? Barbarian. I, I did watch Barbarian. I did watch Barbarian last week. It was awesome. Yeah. Again, Justin, let's talk about Justin. He literally, he has he is a genre unto himself. Just the fucked up, frazzled. I didn't realize that I was a fucking idiot. He was so good in that movie. What a yeah. bizarre flick. I, I, I enjoyed the shit out of that. I love the weird turns that movie makes. Like unbelievable, like, yeah. it's so fun. Um, but to bring the conversation to something that's not as fun, uh, the world lost an icon, especially if you're into nerdy shit. Uh, Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman for a generation and probably generations to come, a Juilliard grad. Um, the man played Batman in animation and also live action, thanks to the Arrowverse. Um, a stage performer, uh, an openly gay actor at a time when that was not okay by society standards. I went to Juilliard, and when you're going into one of our halls, the Allen Tubby Hall, you walk through this hallway, and there's pictures of all of these famous actors that went there. And Kevin Conroy's picture was there, and a signature, and inside of it, was a batarang and i would see that every day going to class he was roommates with robin williams and christopher reeve the three of those lived together the fucking genie superman and batman all of which we've now lost i when i read comics kevin conroy's voice is the voice i hear batman the animated series is my second favorite show my favorite animated show of all time to say he has impacted generations of comic book fans and fans of any medium is an understatement uh yeah chad you uh rob anything you want to say about well, there's nothing really i can add that you haven't yeah that other was than to agree when i read batman he's the voice i hear 100 percent. yeah and, and i would say you, you know my my knowledge of him my experience of him i, I kind of are vicariously through you guys you know because i he wasn't he never was because of the, the time I hit was never my Batman, but clearly every other person I've spoken to, he has affected them. I, I mean, he's become a, a part of the zeitgeist for them and, and will always be Batman to them. So, yeah. And, yeah. and again, thanks to the Arrowverse, I got to see him work a little bit and, you know, in retrospect, got to hear him. So I know how important he is to the, just to the medium, to the genre. So yeah, it sucks. And wait, yeah. 66 years. Yeah. Holy crap. You know, it makes you stare at your mortality. You know, Keith, old people like you and I, you know, we got to really look at that. Don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So our our thoughts are with his family and his loved ones and everybody feeling the loss of the Dark Knight himself. So, 
Um, but that being said, we've been here for nine and a half hours. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. And uh, Chad, where can the people find you? Well, by the time this podcast drops, it may not be there anymore, but Twitter, you know, yeah. we'll see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my Twitter handles uh, Chad129X and the podcast is NQC Podcast. Awesome. And Rob, where can the people find you? At Twitter, uh, on Twitter at Rob Pralgo, um, or I'll be at the space in Marietta. You know where that is. Come on down and see me. Come yeah. on down. Class, classes are only seven, eight, nine hours long. Come on down. And when we teach him, Keith always pops in. And it's mm. fun because whatever I work on for a couple hours, he comes in and totally shits on. And everybody goes, what? And I go, yeah, you never know. There's no right or wrong way to do this. And then we just we just yeah. make fun of ourselves. It's and then I just say and or sucks and I knock stuff over. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk to you next time. Bye. Peace. Peace. <laughs> Not Quite Cool is a podcast recorded in Atlanta, Georgia, in conjunction with Actors Teaching Actors and Bean Dip Productions. Thanks. Thanks.